Hello, this is Pastor Matthew Woods from Grace Lutheran Church in New Albany, Indiana. And this is the weekly devotion for January 9, 2023. It's already the second Tuesday of the month. Today's uh, title, Response Part 2. So I hope that your year is off to a, a good start, got itself rolling well. But today I'd like to continue my discussion on an article that was written before Christmas. And as I said last week, because the author wears the title of pastor and considers herself a Lutheran in her background, I felt a need to respond. The topic of same-sex attraction is often a delicate subject that deserves respectful discussion because personhood is often uh, confused with sexuality. It is the personhood that we want to emphasize. In last week's devotion, we shared a lot about this. When our Creator uh, created us male and female in Genesis 1 and 2, he placed an image of our Creator of himself on us. And later he said, be fruitful and multiply. Notice he separated them. The multiplying had two purposes, neither of which has anything to do with sexual identity. The first was to produce children. Effectively, go make more images of God. Secondly, it was a binding point, the consummation of the covenant of marriage. On this, Matthew 19, 5 through 6, Jesus says, A man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Uh, no longer two, but one flesh. The action of becoming one flesh, however, does not determine personhood. Personhood is established and settled before God says to be fruitful and multiply. They're separate. Again, we also remember from Genesis chapter 3, as we talked about last week, where everything God designed was distorted, frankly, ruined by sin. The way in which temptation came to Adam and Eve was to doubt God's specific words not to touch the, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Every tree you can have but that one. And uh, they were well aware of it. God, But then you have this, did God really say, oh, you surely will not die. You will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. Not just knowing, but determining, which is where the temptation comes in. And this is where we want to start this week. This is where we want to watch out. The word of God is either truth or it is not. The author's article states that we are, and I quote, reading a translation of what is originally written. Throughout time and through the process of translation, the meaning of the Bible, she says, as we know it today, has lost much of its original, of the original author's intent, uh, what they actually intended. Now, we could spend the rest of our time just on this segment and this topic, so I'll do my best to be brief. For starters, Luther was big on scripture, a scripture alone, and as the sole authority of faith, truth, and practice. Today, it is still a fundamental doctrine of the Lutheran Church. Councils and popes often try to read into scripture things that were not there as well, and so the practice of indulgence indulgences, for example, were put into practice and incorporated into the culture of the church when they shouldn't have been. Luther challenged all this based on the authority of the word of God as the sole authority, um, the sacred word of God. Uh, not by popes or councils, but solely by the grace of God are we forgiven as taught in the word. For as Lutheran to suggest that the word of God is incomplete without adding modern interpretation, falls into the same realm as rebellion against the word of God and ultimately a rebellion against Jesus himself. When we defend our sin in any form, we, place, we replace God as the final authority of such things. We determine what is good and evil on such things. We determine what, uh, what sin is and then we try to justify our sin and incorporate it into our lives as something that's okay. Like indulgences, we find ways to sanctify our sinful behavior as something the church should endorse. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God when it comes to following the word of God. We all do this on some level. But let's take a moment to hear the word of God itself. And for the sake of time, I will stick to John, knowing that everything that John says is also repeated in and throughout scripture. John 1, as we've mentioned before, tells us that Jesus is 
and the word are inseparable. Since Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8, and since he was there from the beginning, would not his word also remain the same? If he can be that consistent from the beginning to John 1, why not from there to now? Since Jesus himself defends himself as Savior um, in John chapter 8 and declares his word to be truth in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 17, should we not just take Jesus at his word and what he tells us? After all, we want to believe in things like heaven and love, right? Why wouldn't the rest of the word of God also then be valid and intact as truth? And since Jesus tells us that John, in John 10, that as the good shepherd, he lays down his life and has the authority to lay it down and bring it up again, shouldn't it stand to reason that he can preserve his, his word as well through all time? Wouldn't the same one who created all things in the beginning, as John 1 tells us, also be able to preserve his word for as long as that word remains? That's the question, right? Of course. That's the answer. The error is not in the word of God, but it is always in the sinner and the sin that has ruined us and pulled us away from that word. It's spoiled our thinking. It skews our hearts and our, and our minds toward ungodly things. The word of God is perfectly preserved and intact regardless of whether we believe it or not. And I say this without having time to go into the mountain of extra biblical evidence and archaeological evidence that supports the manuscripts available. Uh, they're all over. It, it just confirms the accuracy of the Bible. Uh, or that, for instance, the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found had whole copies of Isaiah within them, uh, a thousand years older than our, our, re more, our most effective copies, and they're word for word the same. And so, no one who believes the word of God is sacred would be as careless as is presumed or as suggested or implied by this article. A Lutheran pastor really should know better than that. Finally, I go back to the article with the words, it is also written. I go back to the article with that phrase of Jesus. When Jesus was confronted with temptation in the wilderness, the devil tried to quote scripture to defend his position. To quote an authority is one of the oldest tactics of any debate. However, rather than argue the text that was misquoted and how it was misquoted, Jesus simply says, it is also written. You see, one of the hermeneutical principles that we learn as Lutherans is that scripture interprets scripture. Hermeneutics is also, by the way, just so you know, the study of interpreting and understanding scripture. So let's to remind ourselves again this week, the author writes, and this is her quote, of diverse examples of marriage that are found in the Bible. The Bible endorses monogamous marriages between one male and one female, in addition to polygamy, sexual uh, slavery, incest, and forced marriages, divergence, and blessings, and blesses all the varieties of marriage. Now, last week, we made a point using the example of David's and Solomon's polygamy to say that the mention of a thing is not the same as an endorsement of a thing. God simply doesn't endorse it. The scriptures don't endorse it. It just simply sees it. So what she is referring to are passages uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 21, 10 through 14, for example, which lays out the purification ritual to prepare a captive woman for a life as a concubine to an Israelite man. He is to treat her as a husband would treat a wife. In another example, a Hebrew man who rapes a woman is required to pay 50 shekels to her father uh, and then take her home as his wife, Deuteronomy chapter 22, uh, verses 28 through 29. The point is not to justify the crime uh, or to put a blessing upon it, uh, but to put responsibility uh, to the man to care for the woman, to make her a legitimate bride, and to answer, uh, well, to step up and be your husband. The man is to pay a dowry, not a slave money, which is often implied. A dowry, by the way, is traditionally paid to the father in, in the ancient Jewish custom, um, paid to the father of the bride as a process was followed. It was just part of the process. Uh, the price Jesus paid for the bride, the church, ultimately, was his life on the cross. Ephesians 5 again. 
In each case, the law included such things because, well, God's people are sinful. The law was to limit the damage or the actions of the Israelites much in the same way that laws are written today. The writing of a law at any given time is not to legitimize or endorse a crime, but to put limits and punishments in place to enforce godly behaviors. That's the whole point of it. At this point, now, it is worthy to mention what Jesus says, what is also written. Let's go back to that now. Jesus teaches in Mark 7, 20 through 23, what is sacred in terms of sexuality. This is what is also written. Jesus is not neutral on the topic of sexuality. He went on, I quote, verse 20, uh, Mark 7, 20 and following. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For if from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. So here, the word for sexual immorality is a Greek word, porneia. Porneia is a word where we get pornography. Uh, that's what we get the word from. It's a coverall word, however, that would include any act of sex outside of the marriage covenant. The word applies to all forms of sexual practice outside of the original marriage design, including sexual slavery, human trafficking, incest, promiscuity, pedophilia, pornography, prostitution, even consensual sex uh, between two people outside of marriage, and the practice of homosexuality. Now, the word implies a deliberate conscious action that dismisses oneself as an image bearer designed to be a temple for the Holy Spirit. Paul says to flee from sexual immorality because we are temples of the Holy Spirit. The word also deliberately separates from, uh, sep is separated from adultery, uh, which involves a conscious giving of one's heart to someone other than the beloved, a covenant breaking. Uh, this passage is, is certainly uncomfortable to any who are sexually active in any form outside of the marriage covenant, outside of the pattern of Genesis 1 and 2. And historically, it is no accident that um, uh, just about every culture um, that has endorsed idols has also endorsed some form of sexual immorality. Pornea is always a strong sign that a culture is drifting from the Lord. So there we go. Part two. This is part two of my response to the article I mentioned last week. Uh, of course, I, I welcome any ongoing conversation and encourage any ex exploration of God's word in, in, on this subject or any other for that matter. So if you have other topics, by the way, feel free to mention them and we'll explore them here. But again, I appreciate that the article gives us an opportunity to study the word deeper. This is always good. After all, look how much we gained from the discussion uh, about indulgences back in the day. I pray that in the end, what I have given you here is helpful, and I share it with all humility and absolute trust in the Word of God. So may the Lord bless you and keep you in this week, and uh, thanks for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you next time. All right, bye-bye. Talk to you later.